everybody, and welcome back to the Uncultured Cinematic Universe live. Can we live. say live? Kind of. This is live in a sense. We are in the same space. It doesn't look <sighs> like it, look but we're in the same room. <laughs> we touched hands. Oh my God. We're going to be able to do cheers with our cocktails later. Yeah. Uh, let me let me tell you a little bit about what the cocktail cocktail podcast is. Uh, <laughs> here we discuss your favorite movies of all time, as well as the ones that got away. Yep. We look at classic and iconic films from two perspectives, that of the diehard fan and that of the uncultured who's never seen it before until now. That's me. We're your hosts, Joe and Justin, here to act as your guides, playing part as both the fellow enthusiast and the ignorant and uncultured. <laughs> that always feels so mean when I it say does. it. It does. It does. We need to change the script on this. Um, today, we'll be taking an impromptu road trip into the beating heart of America and learning what it takes to be a true drag queen along the way. It's 1995's To Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. 95. 95. Wow. That's uh, so, so this puts Patrick Swayze, you know, several years after Ghost. When did Patrick Swayze leave us? When he left us? It was like in no, the 2000s. It was right? in the aughts. It was in the early aughts, I feel like maybe. I think he made it to like at least 2010, I want to say. Sad, 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 sad. Yeah. Pickering had a cancer. It was a bitch. But, um, what a talent. No kidding. He uh, definitely stands the fuck out in this film. Mm. Um, definitely took the role super seriously, which yeah. I really appreciated. Um, uh, I have some thoughts on that, on who brought what to the table. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> it's really going to be good. Get into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we, can, we can talk about like kind of the rewards recognition that this film got or didn't get. I um, want to know how and... this movie was received when it first came out. Patrick Swayze and Leguizamo in particular were kind of central to that. Uh, people thought that they were the standouts, even though I think Wesley Snipes is fantastic in this. Wesley Snipes definitely um, showed up, but we'll get into it a little bit later. Yeah. I want to I want to give you all my, my thoughts on it. Okay. Before we um, get into Tu Wong Fu, just a couple of things. Justin, we are in person. We're in person again. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are in, uh, my living room surrounded by like a star destroyer's worth of cables and machinery. <laughs> like you guys can't see it, but like if any audio or visuals mess up, like, no, this, this is all just a test. I know this is our first time ever trying something like this in person. And it is a fucking nightmare <laughs> yeah. to set this up. Yeah. The like, like stripping away and unplugging from the comforts of our own home office and stuff like that was such uh, uh, a task. This set is not currently ADA compliant. Like absolutely not. Everything here should be taped down, and it's not taped down. There are electrical, um, you know, hazards abound. My cat is wandering around. He may come and attack us at any moment. Any any one of these electronic things could fail because because your cat just chews through the cable. <laughs> you know, we do have a. Slightly better audio visual setup. If people are noticing, we're using like uh, the phones are our cameras, and then Justin bought brought like official audio equipment instead of my 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 shitty laptop speaker. So it's it's pretty great. Yeah, we'll we'll see how this does um, audio wise as well as video. And we're shooting in a different kind of way too. Uh, we typically do landscape, and now we're doing portrait just mm -hmm. to. Just, you know, go all in with just fucking around and trying new things. We're running like an A, B, C, D test right now. And if any of this messes up, we may have to scrap this whole thing. <laughs> the whole episode, yeah. We'll see. It'll be the long lost forgotten episode. Joe, let's let's dive in here. Um, let's let's talk about the the theme and how we arrived at this movie. Yeah. Um, so we are rounding off Pride Month. Uh, happy Pride, y'all. Happy Pride. Um, we started out Pride Month with um, Justin's pick, which was Black Swan. That was episode 19. Mm -hmm. um, had a great time with that one. We actually that got to good. see that one in theaters at our, can we say like UCU's favorite theater, um, we, the Plaza? Yeah, we'll, we'll slap the trademark on that yeah. and just say like UCU pick. Partnership incoming. Yeah. Uh, fingers crossed. You know what? What's to stop us from just reaching out? If I learned nothing from this movie... It's to just like set your heart and your intentions out into the world and just go get it. You this know? movie's all about like visualizing. Visualize. This, this movie has very much, um, uh, what's it called when like you put everything on a board and stuff? Oh, it's a mood board kind of a thing? This, this movie has mood board energy. Yeah. Mood, mood board, vision board, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, um, so during the month of June, we are talking about um, 
uh, our, our our picks for queer cinema, essentially. Yeah. Um, when we talked about Black Swan, it was a lot of repressed sexuality. It was a lot of bisexuality. Um, and then my pick uh, is a movie that uh, I love and I've seen a bunch before. Um, it's Tu Wong Fu. Thanks yeah. for everything, Julie Newmar. I had always heard of this movie. I always knew what it was. Mm-hmm. And the... Uh, and I don't mean this in like a bad way, but like the pedestal it it sits on in the within the community, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I never took the time to to watch it, and I'm I'm curious to kind of like take the time capsule and go back in time to understand how this was received. And yeah. it's so it was so wild to hear a lot of the same bullshit rhetoric from the conservative right side of things, like be played for comedy. You know, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the last, you know, uh, 10 minutes or whatever with the final standoff. There's some moments in this film where you're like, oh, my. Oh, yeah. They, they said that word. Oh, they said that they went there. This is definitely mid 90s for sure. Oh, some yeah. of the slang. But um, yeah, I think it, it it definitely holds relevance and poignancy to today's issues yeah you know? there's there's definitely like uh there's a time capsuleness to this movie it's definitely a movie that exists in the 90s but i think there's there's a lot of positive directions it's heading in despite feeling dated in certain areas um there's there's a couple different like axes i want to talk about here like where this movie sits within kind of like a boom of 90s queer cinema that i uh was looking and researching on and then also like This movie being a movie about drag performers, like how that has evolved into the the world we are in today. Yes. Um, And I I, I told you this before the episode started, like you're going to need to like walk me through the RuPaul of it all. Because being the terrible queer that I am, I have never (laughs) seen uh, an episode of Drag Race. So I need you to at the very least walk me through what the, the formula is there. Yeah, we'll we'll do a hundred percent that. And I was I was really really excited to to watch this movie for one just to round out you know my own culture of it and understanding, and then yeah, like you said, coming from the the drag race enthusiast mm-hmm. that I am, that you know it, it I rode the coattails of of Ryan because she she jumped on it before I did, um, but it was fun to kind of see like oh I see where like that reference is or. Um, you know, and obviously you get the, the fantastic cameo from RuPaul oh, herself. So many great cameos. In this. Amazing. So yeah, um, I had a great time with this. Uh, I texted you halfway through it of just like, this movie is a delight. It is fantastic. It is, it, I was worried multiple times throughout, I will say of like, oh, where, what direction is this going to go in? Is this going to go into like hate crime territory? Well, there's multiple uh, times when it almost goes there, yeah. It almost goes there, but like the music in the background is being played of like a lighter, jaunty, yeah. like, oh, John Leguizamo is not in danger in this yeah. moment. Patrick but... Swayze will like punch someone in the face and then it'll be like I Love Lucy music in the, in the Yeah, and so away. like in that regard, I did feel... Uh, safe that like okay don't you dare hurt any of these people and like also too like i don't want to watch that that's that's so like heartbreaking and sad but like at the very beginning of the movie you know it's it first of all like it said pg-13 and i was like holy shit Mm pg-13 for a drag movie all right but i guess this is 95 and then you know it said you know like language and violence and i was like oh that i okay i don't want to see that Mm-hmm. If that and you know multiple times throughout the movie, you kind of get the hint that maybe this could go that way. Yeah. Um. But it turns out it's just it's uh it's violence against um queer bigots, oppressors, bigotry. <laughs> yeah. And you love to see it. You love to see Patrick Swayze, you know, dust off uh the old guns and just beat the shit out of somebody. Yeah. I, I want to get into like where you were in in ninety five, like what what little Justin was doing at that point. Um. But. Before then, Justin, this is episode 20. 20. Congratulations. High five again in person. <laughs> We're going to keep high fiving. This is um, going to be great. How, how are you feeling? 20 episodes in. 20 episodes deep. And I think we're finding our, um, definitely our footing with what we like to talk about, what we want to say. Mm-hmm. And then why not episode 20? Let's just fuck around with the formula and do it in person. Oh my God. This, this could, could work. Be, this could be big. This this setup, we could take this on the road, you guys. We talked about that. Like, where could we go where there would be drag queens on a Monday? Um, and there's, I mean, we we should keep it going where like we do something special on every like twentieth episode. 
um yeah. one thing is in person one day we'll have our first guest on episode like 140 i don't know yeah um uh we got to figure out like what a three-way microphone situation looks like yeah we'll bring in a guest or uh you know we can expand the studio and kind of see what it looks like mm-hmm. maybe next time we'll do it in my studio Fill the space at home we'll, we'll try it out we'll just be walking around on the streets with like a boom mic yeah we'll, we can do ucu on the streets that'd be great mm. But yeah, let's uh, let's let's dive into the to the conversation, the topic at hand. Yeah. Um. So tell me, what did you know about this movie before going into it? Like, what was your history here? Uh. So ninety five, I was eight. So I was really into Power Rangers at the time. I was That's super cool. into Power Rangers. Um. I think I had just moved out to Texas with my family, and you know, I was kind of just clutching on to being an eight-year-old boy, that kind of thing, adventuring, riding your bikes, that kind of stuff. So this movie obviously passed me by. Um, I mean, because it like it wasn't my it wasn't in my wheelhouse, right? Uh and also PG thirteen, I'm eight. I'm not gonna watch that. But that doesn't stop me two years later, as we'll find out. Uh when I start watching, you know, Scream and uh fucking can't hardly wait <laughs> as a ten year old. But um I remember 96 specifically, and that's when Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet came out. Oh, yes. And that's when I really became familiar with John Leguizamo and the idea of uh, kind of just like exploring like sexuality or femininity and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I know you haven't seen that movie, but there's uh, it's typical Baz Luhrmann fashion of um, just lot of over the topness. Mm-hmm. So uh that's that's kind of like the time capsule of where I was at, at in 1995. Very nice. Kind yeah. of like the first uh point of seeing gender and sexuality as like a spectrum. Yeah. Um yeah, so th- my my history with this movie, this is actually the first movie I ever saw at our beloved The Plaza. Really? Yeah, and I th- think I don't know if it was a wussy magazine thing, but like there there was obviously like a drag showcase involved kind of like how, of course what we, when we saw moulin rouge yeah um so obviously a great time fantastic uh place to see this movie in particular yeah crowd um, participation i bet through the roof so fantastic um and then I've, I've seen it multiple times um since then and from from what i understand um based on my research like this is this movie holds a place as being like the first mainstream Hollywood movie centered around drag performers. Like uh, yeah. it kind of has the Hollywood formula in that way. And when I say like drag queens, I'm, uh, I I want to differentiate that between like cross dressing for comedy, something like some like it hot or Tootsie or something like that. Or, right? or the, the thing that kind of comes out as a contemporary, which was I think 92 or 93 was Mrs. Doubtfire, right? Mrs. Doubtfire. Where yes. it's not, for, like you said, it's not played for comedy or played for laughs or, or played for like, you know, just, just typical heteronormative of just right, like, right. can't I mean, believe like, this person dressing like this. Mrs. Doubtfire is not a, a drag uh, queen, although there are obvious elements that are similar there. Um, but yeah, um, where this kind of stands in the midst of like 90s queer cinema, you have movies like Mrs. Dra- Mrs. Doubtfire that have that kind of camp element. You have movies like The Birdcage. Um, I wrote down a lot here. Like you have... In and out, my own private Idaho, um, but I'm a cheerleader. Like these different different levels of independent versus more mainstream, different levels of like award success, but it really starts to become part of the cultural conversation. It starts to become more normalized. Yeah. Um, but the the movie that this uh Tu Wong Fu is so often compared to is an Australian movie called Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Um okay. or The Adventures of Priscilla Queen of the Desert. So that was a movie that came out a few years previous that has like a very similar theme. It's in mm-hmm. Australia. And I think it's Hugo Weaving and a couple other Elrond um, himself, yeah. 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 Australian actors. And they're it's this it's 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 a very similar vibe of like drag queens on a road trip, kind of encountering people along the way and like changing uh, yeah. people's lives and perceptions. Which I really appreciated. Like they played them obviously the actors played them, but you know, the movie wrote them out to be just people Mm -hmm. right as opposed to like obviously there is the crux of the the b plot of sheriff dullard coming after them Mm -hmm. and there's that because he's so offended in a way by their mere existence but throughout the town when they eventually showed up to snydersville 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 they're just people 
right? And yeah, I can I can kind of get like how that is. That's so that is really groundbreaking, right? They're they're yeah. they're just individuals. They're not playing caricatures. It's it's really centering on them as the main characters. You never really kind of doubt that they're the focus of the film. Um, I think uh, critics of this movie originally commented on how it kind of follows a safer Hollywood um, formula in terms of like, again, like we were commenting, like they're the, the drag queens are never really in danger, in danger in yeah. middle uh, conservative America, which may not have been the case in real life. Um, but maybe it's, you know, maybe it's like more of a Shit's Creek situation where it's like, it's visualizing a world where um, uh, bigotry in that way doesn't really uh, exist as hard as it would in real life. I'm so um, glad you brought up that reference because we sp- Ryan and I, we watched this the past two nights, and um, that's one of the main takeaways from it is that that whole sequence when they're in Snydersville just feels very much like Shit's Creek, mm-hmm. down to like multiple shots of like the street view and some of the buildings. I was like, this feels like they're on the street down in Shit's Creek. You know, it's these characters from the big city who come into this town and kind of like break up the humdrum day-to-day of it all and kind of add some color but also um receive something in return they learn things about themselves in return they learn that these you know these uh hick characters maybe aren't as simple as they thought um, yeah um uh all along yeah where where exactly is snydersville i don't know they never i mean like it's not that it's like not west West Virginia. virginia yeah um i i picture it like kansas area yeah, it's maybe very flat see how far they got yeah i mean it depends on like what road trip they're taking from new york to la i wonder if there's like a single highway that goes all the way east to west there i think there are several yeah i i think highway 10 is one of them that's really far south though i mean it goes like 10 20 30 does 40. it like that's i think that's how it works like that's why we have <gasps> 20 going east to west in atlanta i know that it's even numbers go east to west and odd numbers go north and south yeah, like 85, 75. Goes up and down, 95, yeah, yeah, yeah. 285 20. is a circle, I don't know. <laughs> if there's three, oh, wait, that is a thing. If it's three numbers it's versus three two, numbers, it's, it's a, a it's circle. A circle. <laughs> it's a never-ending hell. Yeah, that's, that's 100%. This podcast is now about traffic laws and city planning. TCU, Traffic Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's I was, all about the movie Traffic. <laughs> it, oh, my God. Remember that movie? Um, I was, you know, again, to harken back, like I was delighted by this movie because... It is, it is such a good, a feel-good movie, right? And I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know what to expect, obviously. I had, I had no idea what this movie was about. But um, I, I thought it was going to be more of like a competition between the queens or like rise to fame, fall from grace, that kind of thing. I didn't know how that was going to be. But then it takes this turn 10 minutes in. Not even that. Maybe like five minutes in, it's like, all right, we're going to LA and it's going to be a road trip. It's a road trip movie. And yeah. in that way... This it, movie is specifically defined as a road trip comedy. Yeah, I I, t- I totally get it. So like in that ways, I can, or you know, connect it to a movie that I watched a bunch growing up. Um, and they're both kind of road trip movies, I think, in a sense. Uh, Black Sheep and Tommy Boy. I know a little bit about Tommy Boy. I don't know anything about Black Sheep. Anymore. It's it's also um, Chris Farley and David Spade. They're both Chris Farley and David Spade. Yeah joints and they came out like within a year of each other a lot of road trip comedy yeah and it's kind of like a road trip kind of thing one's more political and the other one is more like selling auto parts but they they feel kind of political one (laughs) yeah his dad ran for office and then died and now he's heir to the throne kind of a thing it's crazy (laughs) but yeah that um that feels a very mid 90s kind of thing it's just like it's a road trip movie it's it's uh i think the concept of like fish out of water which is such a you know such a popular trope in in any given movie was very much uh the the, the popular one in the 90s like it's alive very and much well, like yeah. let's let's put these different uh characters who are used to one uh city one location in the middle of uh, another city or location watch cultures clash yeah for for a numerous amounts of reasons uh that we won't get into but like you couldn't make this movie today mm-hmm. because it's a road trip movie and you know that would cost an arm and a leg to drive. Oh, with four dollars and twenty seven cents a gallon. So many wonderful, like specific, like nineties things around like technology and cost. Like how um, they get the car for like what fifty dollars. <laughs> um, and then 
they they basically throw the map out of the car and they're like fucked completely there's no way they're, they're just going off of instinct at that point um uh, in a very like flamboyant way like maps are cheating um yeah patrick swayze i love that i love that scene so much but yeah it's it's so that's so silly right mm-hmm. like you can't do that today like the movie would be boring because yeah. they would run out of money immediately trying to fill up the tank mm-hmm. in that gas guzzling cadillac and uh yeah just traffic would be a nightmare and all the people in the the, the, th- the midwest would know that they were coming because they'd be live streaming it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you're right oh my god so yeah so the, this is a really cool time capsule but it kind of feels and I, I talked about this earlier like it feels obviously very relevant to today like the message and stuff of all that is very poignant and you know rings clear to a ton of the the arguments and stuff that you see on both sides and it's and it's so hilarious mm-hmm. to see that like the conservative side of things are just so threatened by change mm-hmm. and then you know the 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 one of the very last lines um Rizzo I don't I don't know her name the oh, Stalker Channing yeah you know it's You're like I'm gonna learn that name <laughs> <laughs> She says to Vita, like, I don't think of you as a man. I don't think of you as a woman. I think of you as an angel. And it's mm-hmm. just like, oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about kind of like the the pros and cons of like the Hollywoodification of this movie and how uh, kind of like having this be a mainstream movie, obviously, like uh, gets uh, drag queens out into the main culture a little bit more. Um, but also like, do they, do they kind of sand off some of the edges of this? Um, but yeah. first let me, let me give you some film stats here hit me, hit me, hit and then we can dive into like the trailer and stuff. Oh yeah. Um, this movie is directed by Beban Kidron. I um, wanted to know more about them. Tell me more about them. Yes. Uh, she directed Bridget Jones, edge of reason, which is the second one. Um, and I look edge at of it. reason is what yeah. it's called. Yeah. 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 That Did sounds like that? an action adventure flick. It's Bridget Jones' Diary, Bridget Jones' Edge of Reason, and then Bridget, Bridget Jones', Jones Rise of the Bridget Machines. Jones, <laughs> Revenge of the Fallen, and then Bridget Jones' this Baby. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, too Fast, Too Bridget Jones. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's she's known for directing that and a few other things, um, but she's also known for like really advocating for uh, data privacy rights for children, I found, which is cool i uh, really specific like children like playing video games and being online and stuff protect their data sure yeah i'm with it um this movie stars uh wesley snipes patrick swayze john leguizamo stalker channing a rowdy cast of character actors in middle of nowhere america and a host of cameos including rupaul naomi campbell for half a second um robin williams and of course julie newmar um, it was released in September of 1995. It made 47 million against a budget of 30 million. Not oh, bad. Wow. That's expensive. Um, yeah, it uh, it was definitely again like it had that Hollywood budget behind it, and it was seen as a bit of a disappointment, at least compared to like the multiplier of a movie like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, where that was like made for a million and made like 30 million or something sure. like that. Yeah. So, it was it's it's so much of this movie is like in the shadows of uh, that other movie. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like drag queen cinema. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, uh the the cameos in, in this movie, at least in like the first ten minutes, are so great. It's they're it's dynamite like dynamite. A, uh Bird Cage, um, Mrs. Doubtfire era, Robin Williams, like just firing on all cylinders. It's like I a had, and Aladdin. I had no idea. Yeah, he's not that credited. he was in it. Yeah. He's not credited? Well, at least I don't think he's in like the opening credits. I'm sure he's like in the Yeah. The yeah, I'm glad they didn't spoil that. But yeah, as soon as they get to that restaurant and he starts sh- just strolling over, I was just <gasps> delighted. Yeah. He I think he had the biggest laugh uh of the night for us where <laughs> he says his name is like John Jacob Jacob Hammer Smith. Yeah. It's like do people always shout I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> just classic Robin Williams and it's such a like a breath of um you know, just comfortability and that kind oh, of stuff. Cause you just, you just, you sink right into it. Yeah. And it's just, ah, uh, this is going to be a good, a feel good movie. Him like immediately launching into Spanish with uh Chi Chi. <laughs> so great. It's so dynamite. Uh, it's, it's, it's so great that this is like a, a piece of Robin Williams that is still there to discover. You know, yeah. like, you think you have all of the Robin Williams that we're going to get, but he Mm-mm. still has like pockets of himself. I know it's there. great. Yeah. It was dynamite. Obviously, you know, the, the RuPaul um, reveal, 
RuPaul's so great in this too. Hey, and you yeah. you texted it to me. You know, uh, RuPaul's drag name is so fucking dynamite. Rachel, Rachel Tension. <laughs> like it's amazing. Comes out wearing a Confederate <laughs> flag dress. Like the oh my god! Could you imagine trying to do this movie today? Do that exact thing? Like hilarious. So good. So good. Um. Oh yeah. I, I. We're gonna have to have like a, a RuPaul's Drag Race segment because I want to see like how that's evolved since then. Absolutely. Um. You do get Naomi Campbell for a second. Uh, Where? Talking to. She's the the girl in the restaurant where she goes up to Wesley Snipes' character and is like, "I wish I was as pretty as you." And knocks oh. him. Oh, like, good luck, <laughs> good luck. Okay, I miss that. Oh my god, <laughs> that's hilarious. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, so a uh, bunch of cameos uh, in the beginning, and then they hit the road, uh, and then it kind of becomes like. Uh, a road trip, Midwest, heartwarming comedy with some romance and some drama. Elements. So much drama and, and love and tension and stuff. Uh, yeah. I didn't expect that at all. I didn't expect the the layover yeah. in Snydersville. You and I was like, oh, man. Just like little pockets of stuff across That's what America. I thought. And, and then, then I was like, oh, man, they're still here. Most of the movie's Snydersville. Yeah. I was like, oh, and then we're halfway through. Okay, and they're going to finish out here. Interesting. And then so, like 30 seconds at the end in California, which is so great. Right. Um. How do we do the trailer here? Let's oh yeah, this yeah. Let's 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 figure out how to do the trailer. Here we go. Let's watch this trailer, Joe. It's a good one. Wesley Snipes. He's been a killer and a commando. Patrick Swayze, he's been a heartthrob and a hero. But these tough guys are about to face the most physically challenging roles of their careers. Let's give it to him, girl. Meet Vita Boem. Enchanté. Why are you crying? Maybe she just found out Menudo broke up. Miss Noxima Jackson. Jesse's daughter. And their protege, Chichi Rodriguez. I'm the Latino Marilyn Monroe. I got more legs than a bucket of chicken. They were headed for Hollywood. Think of it as Easy Rider in dresses. On a sacred mission. Must take this message from Miss Newmar with us across the land. Going on right here, a celebration. But along the way, they had an unexpected stop. You know what you career girls want? Careers? Oh, that is some sugar. Please, no. 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 I can't believe this. You don't quote me, but I think this one is no, deceased. A dead white policeman? Now, they're stranded in a strange land. Well, ladies, welcome to Snydersville. And you thought the dust bowl was over? This is the presidential suite. That must have been one of those bad presidents. You got beat up by a girl. <laughs> And before they leave, do you like my nails? They may turn this town from drab to utterly, utterly fabulous. Universal Pictures and Amblin Entertainment present. How do I look? Like the Miami sound machine just exploded all over you. Wesley Snipes. Look, I'm sorry about the way the Civil War turned out. Patrick Swayze. I gather you like hitting ladies. Some ladies need to get hit. And John Leguizamo. I gotta go. I got cramps. To Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. Mm. Turn it out. God, that movie, that that trailer rips, dude. Yeah. Um. So I. I, I I don't envy the job of the person who had to make the trailer and make sense of the title of this movie. So I want to specifically talk about the title here. Right. Like, if you see that on a poster and you have no idea what this movie is about, what does that say to you? Who the fuck is Wong Fu? <laughs> That's like a question raised in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. To Wong Fu. Thank you for everything. Thank you for what? I mean, it's... And why is Julie Newmar involved? It makes it memorable at the very absolutely because it's so ridiculously long uh-huh yeah such a long title there's random exclamation points in places where you don't think that there are really uh, where <laughs> yeah it's after thanks for everything oh thanks uh, for everything okay it's a sentence yeah it's a proper sentence anyway yeah i think uh the the trailer itself even doesn't um um 
fully emphasize like how committed the actors are in this role like it's it's not even like a joke in that way like uh i think swayze and leguizamo and um snipes are like really doing this and it's not necessarily like they're not kind of winking at the camera in any way they're no. fully uh into uh the roles of being these drag queens yeah uh, and, okay so giving here's, them fully realized characters right and here's what okay so i i hinted at this earlier so obviously all three of them bring something unique to the to the picture mm -hmm. and um i think top tier obviously is patrick swayze just putting his all into this role mm -hmm. takes it very seriously uh sinks into it um i think i don't know maybe 15 20 minutes maybe 30 minutes in uh disappeared of like oh that's patrick swayze yeah. you know i was like oh that's that's just that's just vita they just you start know? to look like completely different characters yeah uh same with John Leguizamo as Chi Chi Rodriguez. <laughs> uh, again, just sinks into the character, makes me really believe it. Um, now, controversial. I think Wesley Snipes maybe dialed it in a little bit. Oh, you don't like Snipes in this? I okay. Now I'm not saying that. Justin doesn't like Snipes in this movie. Justin hates Snipes in this movie. No, I thought I thought Wesley Snipes did a great job in the role, but I didn't feel the same amount of commitment and heart as the other two. Mm -hmm. Not to disparage the role or what he brought to the table, but I could just believe it a little bit more that Patrick Swayze was just embodying Vita Boehm. Uh, John Leguizamo was embodying Chi Chi. I felt like maybe, and this is this is just splitting hairs, you know, uh, Wesley Snipes is just playing the role as Wesley Snipes. Mm -hmm. uh, he So Wesley Snipes definitely doesn't get as many emotional moments in this movie the same way like Leguizamo and Swayze do. Um, and I think Golden Globes kind of picked up what you're picking up on because okay. they uh, nominated Swayze and Leguizamo and then Wesley Snipes kind of got left out of that. Um, that's, I mean, yeah, that's that. That's just the way the cookie crumbles, you know? Like, I still loved the the interaction between Noxima and who's the old lady? Who's the old lady? Oh, I can't remember her name, but I know who you're talking about the but, the old lady who really likes old films and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that was those were great scenes, and mm -hmm. that was really touching in some ways. That you know she would open up and start talking to only Noxima because they're they made a mm -hmm. connection and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but Wesley, Wesley Snipes is definitely playing it a little bit more heightened, uh, whereas um, Patrick Swayze's character is a lot more earnest, grounded, um, and like, yeah. really um, like holds holds uh, the emotions on the shoulder, right? um and and so and then john leguizamo is obviously just like a completely fireball not afraid to confront anyone not afraid to just uh put herself out there uh, as a this fully herself um yeah and not afraid to like form these relationships with people yeah and uh, in that regard you know you mentioned heightened you know chi chi rodriguez is a heightened character over the top saying these insane things a lot of the time <laughs> but they felt more honest earnest coming from that performance from that performer versus i don't know in a sense wesley snipes feeling like he's just reading lines yeah you know uh, yeah. and maybe that's that's attributed to writing or what whatever he decided to bring to the role that kind of thing but i mean it's not a bad role in any regard well yeah and i think i think patrick swayze gets this the most uh one-on-one -on -one time with um uh stucker channing's character who's kind of the the abused housewife that they come across uh, in this in this town, and they make friends with her. They're staying at her bed and breakfast type situation. Yeah. Her husband's the mechanic that's working on their car. He sucks. He sucks. Um, and they kind of show her that there's more to life, and there's uh, life worth sticking up for. In this yep. Way. Yep. It was great. Uh, that that was definitely the heart of the movie, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the that was the message. You know, like I already said, you know, fully encapsulated by the ending line of you know think of you as an angel which mm -hmm. you know obviously by the end of that movie you're misty eyed and that kind of stuff and it feels really good yeah um but I mean, yeah that's that's the central part you mentioned going into this movie that you thought it might be more about like the competition of it all and you can you can really easily see a different movie where um vita bohem and noxima jackson are like competing rivals drag queens, yeah like, uh wanting to go for the crown but they are so like best friends supportive of each other the entire way it never even like the the idea of like being the best drag queen in America never even comes up. Uh, they're they're both equally kind of 
uh, shitting on Leguizamo a little bit and kind of teaching her how to be the, yeah. the proper drag queen, teaching yeah. her about uh, what it means to be a drag queen as opposed to uh, a, a boy, boy in a dress. Yeah. Up in a dress, right? Yeah. Um, and so, like, they, they, they have this energy. They have this kind of, like, rapport between them where you can tell there's such a history there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even though, again, like, you get into kind of, like, the Hollywood of it all, the, the story has to focus a little bit more on Swayze as, you know, the white male star a little bit. And it's it's maybe a – I don't know how unrealistic it is that, like, he's the one who taught uh, Noxzema how to be a drag queen. I don't know if that would be the case in real life. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I that was one of the things that stuck with me watching this movie is, like, the, the relationships – between them uh between all three of them are kind of the the core of the movie um it's and, very familial in yeah. a way um the in, in certain instances vita and noxima feel like you know you know your your two moms kind of thing kind of fighting and bickering they've been through it but then some of the times they feel like siblings right your older two yeah. your older aunts kind of thing helping you out through things and then definitely you see a really good trajectory of chi chi kind of growing up and uh earning her stripes, you know, in a sense, the lessons and that kind of stuff. And I, I think, um, like, you, you, you kind of, like, read the critiques of this movie, um, and it's 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 it often touches on the fact that, like, Patrick Swayze and Wesley Snipes don't necessarily have, like, romantic subplots, not with each other, but just, like, as the gay men that they're playing in this movie who are drag queens, they're kind of um forces of nature they're more they're there's like that fairy godmother gay character trope yeah. where it's just like they're, they're here a little to fix asexual um, yeah in this movie yeah even though um john linguizamo's character does get to play around with more of a relationship with uh one of the snydersville folks in this bobby bobby ray um <laughs> yeah um but that eventually like also dies down and it's 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 much more about their relationships as friends mm -hmm. um uh, even if that maybe sacrifices a more realistic storyline where like they have their own romantic connections with other people. Yeah. Which, you know, could have added an interesting tertiary plot yeah. to it, or maybe just some background. But I, I think it succeeds still in a way. And I was talking earlier about like, you know, the positive directions that this movie points towards is like, sure. Like the, they aren't like fully realized, like romantic characters in the way that like, a uh, a straight couple would be in a classic rom-com or something like that but they still have arcs they still have like flaws that they address in each other you know like they talk about how uh vita is way too in everyone's business and yeah kind of like is is dealing with her own emotional conflict by fixing everyone else's mm -hmm. and uh, even noxima like has reservations about interacting with people because you can tell that she's kind of been hurt in the past mm -hmm. and, like chi chi's a little bit too out there and she doesn't really understand like the roles and responsibilities of it's great dragon. yeah uh, it's a, it's a really well-rounded pie mm -hmm. that you get at the end between the three of them and they it all kind of comes together when they they resolve their conflicts towards the end uh, with each other yeah uh the 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 scene when they're at the the dinner table and you know vita and uh chi chi are like apologizing to each other mm -hmm. you know it's really sweet it's really sweet um and i i did have a note here it's almost like it's a level of relationship and like uh, relating to each other that these townspeople almost can't recognize. Um, yeah, these townspeople are more conservative and reserved, even though they're not like you know they're they're not like outwardly aggressive or anything to these people. They're very accepting mm -hmm. uh, of these new characters, most of them. Um, but like the the way that these um, drag queens kind of relate to each other is just on a different level, on a different spectrum. Yeah, almost like they can they can easily forgive they can easily have these very high emotions and then go into like loving each other uh, mm -hmm. just because like they're they're more used to that like fluid way of uh, interacting yeah it's it, it it is really refreshing and you know really eye-opening you know for 1995 for this story to be told and um yeah i i, I wish i could take a a, a trip back to kind of understand you know how this landed yeah you know yeah, yeah. um okay before we get into um, additional thoughts here, let me try and time you for a <laughs> oh, one-minute plot description without my phone. Hang on. Okay. I'm eagerly awaiting. You can do it. Do it on my iPad. Joe's got an iPad, folks. I have an iPad. 
and it is impressive. It's huge. <laughs> it's so okay. ridiculous. Okay. Are you ready to give a one-minute plot description of Tu Wong Fu? Thanks for everything, Julie Newmark. Yes. Okay, your time starts now. The film centers around three enigmatic drag queens, Vita Boheme, Noxima Jackson, Chi-Chi Rodriguez. Chi-Chi is an up-and-coming star. Vita and Noxima are uh, more mature, uh, been-around-the-block professional career ladies. Uh, they are competing for like Miss New York, I think, and they tie. Uh, but their prize is you get to go out to LA, I think, for Miss American drag queen. So they do, and they're like, Chi Chi, you're coming with us. And then they end up stranded in Middle America, Snydersville, and they turn it around. Uh, you think people aren't going to accept them, but they do. And they, they throw a strawberry social, whatever that means. Uh, I wish we could have seen more what that was instead of just a party in the middle of the street. Uh, they they almost kill Chris Penn, but he comes back to life and he hates it, but he loves it at the same time. And they change the minds of everyone and they're all the better for it. And everyone loves him. Oh, and that's time. Yeah, you kind of covered it. Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I spent 30 minutes at the top of the movie. Yeah, you spent you spent 30 seconds. I on did the a New Joe York portion. I pulled a Joe. Yeah, I've I've had really bad plot descriptions on this this podcast um but no i think it covers it it's basically it's road trip comedy where they they get stranded for most of the movie um and it's about them kind of transforming this town but also just like bringing out the emotions and the color that were already there yeah how okay so help me understand like what is the main point of going out to la they want they tied they there's like a drag queen they they won regionals they're going to nationals (laughs) Patrick Swayze and Wesley Snipes tie for like best drag queen in New York City. And yeah. then they go to like best drag queen in America competition. Right. And then they decide to take Chi Chi on as like their protege and kind of show her the ropes of drag queen. Right. Okay. So that's the whole point of it, of going out there. Mm-hmm. All right. So then when they m- eventually at the very end, when they make it, And like your Miss American drag queen is Chi Chi Rodriguez. She wasn't even in the running. Right? Uh, Right. That doesn't make sense. You're right. And then Julie Newmar is there to hand over the crown. And so like it's a delusion of somebody's. We're gonna call Universal up and demand our money back because you're you're doing plot hole after plot hole. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's it's there's certain like uh almost magical realism elements to this movie. Sure. Where uh Again, like that that fairy godmotherness of the drag queens kind of comes out. Um, but I think the idea is that they uh, help Chi Chi become such a fully realized drag queen in her own right that through that power she has she has she won. can she can do whatever or she maybe, wants to. Maybe yeah. it's the following year. We don't know. Maybe it is. Yeah. Uh, I wish there was a little more clarity, but I think I think that was a fun way to end it. Of just like, oh, Chi Chi made it. Yeah. Right. Uh, she is now a fully fledged drag queen and now she won nationals or whatever it is and julie newmar was there (laughs) so that's where i was like hey wait a minute hold on here i guess you gotta have julie newmar in a movie with her title in the title yeah um okay real quick justin cheers oh uh, yeah which we can do in person now yeah look at that tell me tell me a little bit about what you're drinking here okay Ah, it burns so good Mm. that is a uh, I'm calling it a um, a little Latin boy margarita. <laughs> um, so it's essentially just a spicy margarita. Uh, you know, made some. Uh, Ryan helped me make some jalapeno uh, simple syrup, and then uh, I just used your tequila yeah. <laughs> and triple sec that from your painful. kitchen. It was great. Um, little but Latin yeah, boy and drag. Why are you crying? Yeah, I was trying to. I was trying to think of like how else can you dress up. Uh, a margarita and I couldn't land on anything but I made it spicy because it's Latin and I myself and, and a little Latin boy Aww. at heart so see that kind of works yeah um, what do you got what is that that I'm little pink working thing with what I'm calling the drag princess um, based off of uh, Chi Chi's self given title when she's not fully a drag queen yet yeah it's essentially an Aperol spritz without the orange peel garnish because it's not complete yet it's Ooh. On its way. Um, to it, and also I didn't have any oranges. Um, I like that we both gravitated towards John Leguizamo's character. I think I think he's kind of the standout in this movie. He's giving the most energy in a way. The most energy, and it is a complete plot, mm-hmm. uh, a complete arc of you know, hurrying, rushing to get to the competition, 
um, you know, to the very end of being a winner, right? Yeah. Learning love along the way, learning the rules of <laughs> becoming a, a drag queen proper, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think what I love about this movie, if like we're getting down to just like big thoughts here, like this movie c- could have so easily been and maybe would have been if it was released 10 years later, like a comedy about how making fun of drag queens almost in a way like yeah uh, like these men are dressing up as women but there's there's like an earnestness to it where like they're everyone's just like really feeling these real emotions they're feeling joy they're feeling love for each other and Mm -hmm. like there's never really a point where again like uh either the three leads are kind of winking at the camera like oh how silly all this is no and and that's what i really loved and appreciated about it because you know i wasn't i'm still not really certain of the era of 1995 of like how just like just gay culture period was accepted or viewed upon the world, mm-hmm. you know? Um, you know, I didn't, again, didn't really get a taste for it until like much later in life and then understanding, but I can imagine, you know, this movie probably hit theaters and, you know, uh, TV screens and stuff like that, showing trailers and stuff like that. And just middle America being just clutching their pearls. Yeah, I mean, you know, they don't understand a massive yeah. blockbuster hit or anything. But I like to think like it introduced people to the concept of of drag queens as uh, kind of uh, these characters living their best life. Um, yeah, and they're not gender. Yeah, and they are just. And again, like I said, they are just people. This is how they can be their most authentic selves mm-hmm. um, uh, via the the clothes and the wigs that they wear. Yeah, like, and that would be. Uh, that is that message right there is kind of beneath the surface Mm -hmm. like that's what we're close reading with it although like that is the narrative these days right Mm -hmm. be your most authentic self be happy with who you are that kind of thing explore who you are that kind of thing that would be more explicitly stated i think yeah yeah so when we talk about um drag queens these days obviously the the biggest thing on the mind is like the the empire that rupaul has Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um so there's RuPaul's Drag Race. There's RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars, from what I understand. Yeah, there's like, like UK. The, the there's Hunger Latin America. There's, there's Canada. Um, yeah. Tell me, tell me about like what goes into a typical like Drag Race episode, and like what's what's the reason to be watching these days? So are we? We're entering Drag Corner. Drag is this, corner? Is this yeah. Drag Corner? Just Drag get... Corner. We're gonna we're gonna okay. do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're taking advantage of the the visual medium. Uh, here we are. Oh my God. This isn't mine. This is Ryan's. That one is mine. Joe's putting on my wig, and I'm wearing my wife's wig. That's one of them. This is our from our costume closet. But yeah, I'm donning a blonde, mid shoulder length, uh, down my shoulder blades, and Joe's. <laughs> I kind of have like a. Winona season one, Stranger Things. Oh yeah, got some right bangs. Now. Yeah, some Silkwood. Yes. Yeah. Um, I look like a struggling mom in the eighties with a six kid. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's the Reva McIntyre song playing in the background. Yeah. Loving mom who's got two jobs. A single mom who has two jobs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Hundred percent. Uh, drag corner. Here we are. Um, yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, Ryan started watching Drag Race. And we talked about the dates last night. She started probably like 2018. Um, she would watch them on her lunch break. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was just, you know, that's that's how she passed the time. And by that point, I think they were on like season, I don't know, eight. Season seven or eight of Drag Race. Okay. Um, so she had a lot to kind of go through. She started season one, did the all-star seasons in between as well. So uh, around 2020 is when I got into it during the height of the pandemic. Um, probably twenty late 2020, early 2021, when season 11 came out, I think. That was the first season that I watched from beginning to end. Okay. So it was a pandemic watch for you. It was a pandemic day. watch for me, and then now, like, you know, there's still ample stuff that I need to go back. I, I haven't watched all of season 10 or the preceding seasons before that, but I've seen most of the... Uh, all star seasons, I think four, five, six, and seven, I've seen. But okay, so a, se- a typical season of Drag Race, RuPaul's Drag Race trademark, uh, registered trademark, mm-hmm. um, centers around 
uh, anywhere between like 12 to 14 drag queens from across America. Okay. Uh, a lot of them are typically from like New York or LA or things like that, but there you get a good mix of people from around, uh, around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, some people from Atlanta, some locals and things like that show up. So there's a group of girls there that show up and it's kind of like top model in a sense. Have you watched top model? I mean, I, I understand the concept. Like one person gets voted off every week and they're kind of like, it shows the behind the scenes of like how they do their stuff and then they do their stuff. A hundred percent. Yeah. So each episode, there's like a different kind of like challenge or something that takes place. Right. Uh, some of them are acting challenges, uh, where they'll kind of like group up and do, um, like scenes from like a fake movie or something like that, mm -hmm. or a, a drama TV show or something. Um, and they're always really, uh, something about RuPaul, RuPaul really loves a pun. Mm -hmm. Girl loves a pun. So, uh, one of the seasons they did, uh, uh, gays anatomy <laughs> and they were all doctors and it was hilarious. Um, and they do like improv challenges where it's like live acting, that kind of stuff. And they're playing off of each other, trying to be funny and that kind of thing. Yeah. Or, um, you know, there's obviously there's like a girl group challenge that they'll do every so often where they like have to sing a song they write lyrics and they record a song and they have to dance and do all the thing uh sometimes there's a, a talent show it's a, it's a mixed bag of things like that um and then a uh, crown jewel we've talked about this on a couple uh, episodes ago there's uh, a big one that's really popular which is called the snatch game right which is based off the game show match game where uh it's like eight or so panelists of like celebrities uh -huh. right and then you have two contestants and they're usually guests, guests, guest stars or whatever who jump on. Mm -hmm. And uh, RuPaul asks them a question and they answer it. But also the celebrity guests answer it at the same time. So you're trying to match a, uh, of the eight. So like, I don't know, how many light, how many, I don't know. I thought, I thought RuPaul's Drag Race was truly just every episode. Like you do a snatch game and then you do a limp sync. And like, that's it. No. Okay. So each episode, <laughs> each episode centers around a thing, a competition, that kind of stuff. Right. And then there's in between, they go they're in the, uh, in the work room as it's called the W E R K, the work room. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're, you know, they're beating up their faces. They're doing things. They're getting ready or they're the talking making heads and all the that. talking heads or the drama. That's where the drama comes in. Uh, and then they go and perform and do the thing. And then they're all judged. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, RuPaul and like her, you know, panel of, of either guest judges or like Carson Kressley is on there a lot, Michelle Visage, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ross Matthews, and a bunch of other people show up uh, every so often. Every every episode, there's like a celebrity guest or something like that who's a who's a uh, a judge. Mm -hmm. So they judge all of them, and there's usually like a, a winner, and that person will usually take home like a cash prize or something like that. And then on a typical drag race season, there's the two bottom queens. Mm -hmm. And they have to lip sync against each other. They have to lip sync for their <laughs> life, and it's uh, it's hilarious. Um, and and it's a it's a very survivor in that kind of way of like yeah, they're not pleading their case. They're like performing to stay on there. And you know the the famous line that Rue says to them every time they go out, it's like this is your last chance to impress me, and keep your uh, keep competing, uh, and. Um, Two queens stand before me. Yeah, it's all this kind of stuff. And don't fuck it up is the thing that she says. And they perform. And sometimes there's missteps or a lot of times someone just like completely blows the other out of the water and they become a lip sync assassin, that kind of thing. And it's amazing. That's uh, fantastic. And then uh, they get to the end and the the grand prize now is, you know, like $20,000 or something like that. Oh. It, it's big. And then they just get like bragging rights for the rest. For of the, the next year years, yeah. kind of a thing. And then they come back. Uh, and then All Star Seasons rules are different, but yeah, that's 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 Drag Race. And uh, Joe, I'm gonna get real with you. <gasps> drag Race, I attribute. You know, we said it's a pandemic watch and that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. That's when people understood a lot about themselves, uh -huh. right? During the pandemic, Drag Race specifically and TikTok, kind of just like understanding, getting through it. That's what opened my eyes up to be like, oh, maybe I am bisexual. <laughs> just in Pride Month. Pride Month. In person, high five. Because, you know, you look at some of these people and you're like, oh my God. Yeah. She's stunning. And then they're out of drag and you're like, that's still a stunning person. Yeah. Oh my God. It's, it's, it's what Tu Wong Fu is all about. It's like, it's like helping people find the, the strength and emotion and the power and the feelings that are already there. Yeah. Um, 
Ah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, right? And it goes along with the the thing that I've seen on TikTok before. This was years ago of like, uh, you know, there's the, the understanding of, you know, autism and that kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you think a lot of everybody has like a little bit of autism to them, mm-hmm. like that's not true. Like, you know, that's the whole thing. And then it's like, oh, well, everybody's a little gay. Everyone's a little gay. But not everyone thinks that way. And she's like, oh, well, then that's just me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought everyone was a little gay. Um, yeah. So, like, understanding that, you know, like, sexuality, attraction, attraction, all that kind of stuff is fluid. And, you know, um, I had always kind of historically understood bisexuality of just, like, action. Yeah. And not attraction. Yeah. And then that's what it is. It's just like what it's fifty percent women and fifty percent boys. And it's gotta be fifty percent, otherwise you're gay or you're straight. You don't meet your quota by the end of the year, you get your card revoked. <laughs> or punched. <laughs> <laughs> but like understanding that truly is just like, oh, okay. And then there's you know, there's there's power in that, there's growth in that of just understanding like who you are. It's just like, oh fantastic. Yeah. Like and it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, that person's hot. Fantastic. I mean it it, it all comes back to the idea of like drag performers really being like culture leaders in mm-hmm. that way like so so much of what we now normalize in the culture originated uh with these uh these drag queens um, absolutely they are they are tough pioneers mm-hmm. they've they shattered ceilings they broke through thick walls and stuff like that to mm-hmm. you know to to do a lot and you know uh, the the community at large and humanity you know attrib- attributes and should to um drag queens and you know everyone else mm-hmm. they, they are true pioneers of moving the world forward it's using the tools you have to be your your truest self Absolutely. Um, side note I, I i love how maybe this is just because of like rupaul's drag race but like i love how much lip syncing has become associated with drag these days um because like you don't necessarily have to be a singer in your own right. I don't even know if a lot of these queens can sing, but like it, it is so much purely about just the performance of mm-hmm. it all, right? Yeah. Um. It's it's so much about like the visual presentation and how much energy and how much emotion you can put into your performance. Um. And that that kind of like uh is is shown in a different way in this movie where it's kind of interesting how. They they portray these drag queens in Tu Wong Fu, but they're never really out of their their drag queen personas uh, in a way. Right. Um, it it yeah. kind of shows flashes of that. Like mm-hmm. it shows uh, Patrick Swayze and Wesley Snipes getting ready in the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it shows like some wigs getting snatched a little bit, but like uh, they 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 sleep in their wigs for for what for all we know. It's kind of it's it's I don't know if it's like a. <laughs> A misunderstanding or maybe this is kind of like an easier way to again fit into that hollywood sure. formula where yeah. it's like these 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 drag characters are existing in drag uh the whole time maybe when maybe like that's that wouldn't be the case in real life yeah yeah you you get a, a good feel for that um in this movie and uh we'll we'll definitely go back and we'll circle around we'll watch a full season of of drag race to oh fully God. understand that because <clears throat> you know some of them that i've seen you know they they bring up that like, yes, this is my persona. You know, I am when I put on the makeup and the, uh, the outfit and the wig and that kind of stuff, I embody this person and I become that person. And outside of it, you know, I'm trying to learn how to bridge that gap, how to bring that energy into my personal life, that kind of thing. And it's the whole thing of living your authentic self, mm-hmm. the power in, um, you know, being free in when you can fully express yourself. RuPaul talks about that all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like you're not afraid anymore. So how do you how do you knock down that wall between like I'm just this person in this setting versus like that is just who I live. It's by. It's, it's an interesting phrase that comes up uh, a few different times in the movies. What do they do? They call them like they don't call them working girls. It's like what career girls. Career girls. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So they they kind of introduce them themselves as like three career girls in this small town, and then the 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 bobby lee character the the younger teenage girl <laughs> asks like oh i like i want to be a career girl when i grow up how do you do that and it's it's interesting to think like in that time like it doesn't matter that they're actual like girls in like a biological sense it's it's the energy that they're bringing it's that, that level of independence and freedom and like an emotional expression like they are 
they're career girls. Like yeah. this is this is they 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 proudly wear their femininity, and that that's kind of like their whole world here. Yeah, and the whole thing that like femininity isn't weaker mm-hmm. than masculine energy. In mm-hmm. fact, it's it's more powerful in in a lot of regards, mm-hmm. uh, if not all of them. And um, yeah, you know that's that's where Vita brings the power to uh carol ann's character of mm-hmm. just like you don't have to take this shit anymore that kind of thing you're your own person like it's it's great it's it's very reba in those moments it's yeah. very reba yeah it's it's very it's it's very like the, the chicks um <laughs> they, they killed earl and all that oh it um, is i love those moments yeah um let's get into some some final thoughts here and then i have a a, a game that i want to run by you for sure um what else do i have here i don't know yeah, um, so one of the more uh, positively reviewed elements of the film that we talked about um, is the, the relationships between the main characters, how they uh, have each other's backs and have this like level of friendship um, that uh, often isn't seen in characters like this in these movies where they're often more like side characters that serve one purpose. Uh, yes, they're know, not right? the gay best friend kind of right. thing. They are um, the the heroines of their own in their own right. Yeah, even though like they they do have moments where they are literally playing the fairy godmothers and kind of like directing the 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 straight dancers down below. Um <laughs> but <laughs> that's that's kind of a, a direction you want to see these films evolve going forward is like uh dive more into the personal lives of these uh, drag queens, right? Yeah. Like, give them more uh, dimensions when it comes to like romantic interests and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's hopefully what you see more of when it gets into like RuPaul's Drag Race or any movies about drag queens uh, coming out these days, right? Mm-hmm. Which I'm not too familiar with. I don't know. I can't name any movies off the top of my head that we need are more like drag cinema. We need more drag cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Easily. Uh, drop us a line. You s- uh, wait. What's our email? Uncultured Podcasters at Gmail uh, dot com or U- UCU uh, Pod at Gmail. Fuck. What is Fuck. our email? One of those. <laughs> Just hit us up on Instagram. Yeah, we don't check the email. I don't even think we have access to the email. One of those we don't. I think we have yeah. the Gmail. I don't know. Send us an Instagram message. Yeah, because we, we'd love to, to round this out. Uh, if we play our cards right, Joe, we could do something, another episode next week if we wanted. But mm-hmm. I don't know. That could be asking too much. Pride month, y'all. Pride month. We stay busy. Um, okay, Justin, any last thoughts on Tu Wong Fu before I get into this game that I've created for you? This was so much fun. Uh, I will definitely be revisiting this movie a bunch just because it is such a good, like, feeling movie. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you leave with a good positive outlook. Um, it feels like a good episode of a drag race, you know, to me. It's an energizing movie, and it's hilarious. And it's positive, and there's no, like, you know ill you know things that happened to them like it very well could have it could have taken the dark knight kind of thing where they grounded it in reality uh-huh. and there would have been you know sexual assault and hate crimes and stuff like that and it just would have been de- fucking depressing there's certain there's certain elements of the film that may be dated like certain language that they use but it, it kind of like parallels how stalker channing ends the movie like you said where like you don't really consider these drag queens like men or women you consider them angels and then um patrick swayze's character is like sure I that think seems that's healthy, healthy. <laughs> <laughs> that's such it's a good ending like line the, the direction that this movie is headed just that it's it's a healthy direction yes. like and and that's where i think this movie transcends a lot of you know that that kind of era early 90s mid 90s and that's why i think it, it could it stands out obviously for just a lot of the rhetoric that we're hearing today like mm-hmm. you could re-release this movie as a brand new one today like wipe the uh brains of everyone who've seen this movie and like it's a new one Mm -hmm. and it would still hit this movie would still slap you know because it resonates so well yeah yeah i mean that's where you get into the hollywood formula like it's it's following previously determined structures of how a story should work but with Mm -hmm. these new types of characters on different terms yeah Um, yeah overall uh overall definitely a plus because you know it was such a delight Mm -hmm. it was such an unexpected journey as as it was um and, you know, I didn't expect them to stay in Snydersville half the movie, and they do, and it turns out to all be great. Mm-hmm. And and they all grow for it. So great. Are you ready to play a game? 
I am ready to play a game. You, what was the text you you said to me earlier? This is either I the, said this is going to be like uh, the greatest or the worst game. <laughs> yeah, or an affront to humanity. There's not going to be any in between. Oh man! Uh, so Joe, I had so much fun doing the uh, the the video and the song for this. I told you last time I get to do a RuPaul song, mm -hmm. so um, you get to live it. <laughs> Here we go. Come on, Joe, help me play Name That Drag. Here we go, time to get gooped and gagged. Come on, Joe. Joe. <laughs> the UC Ruse, name that drag. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, and I'm so sorry for what's about to happen. Okay, um, Justin, uh -huh. we're going to play a game called Name That Drag. Great. Okay. Is this a game about dragons? No. Ah. No, I didn't go that far. I, I, I thought about it. Um, so we have covered uh, 20 movies at this point on this podcast. Yes. Um, and one of the most uh, notable things that I think of when you, uh, I think of drag performers is these like incredibly fierce names that they're able to come up with, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, you got to have a great drag queen name if you want to make it in this mm -hmm. industry. Yes, you do. Um, so I have come up with 10 drag queen names. Okay. And I want you to think back to the movies that we've covered. Okay. And I want you to tell me which movies inspired each name. Okay, and there is a right and wrong answer. Oh, I, I'm not even giving you multiple choice. Like okay. I am, you're you're gonna tell me uh, one name. <laughs> um, you're gonna tell me a movie. One movie. Yeah, got it. You're you're picking from the the movies that we have covered. Got it. Okay. Um. So going into this, I realized that this is a lot harder than I initially thought because drag queen names aren't necessarily like puns. They're more just like, uh, how fierce can you make it? And I I tended to lean a little bit more onto the pun side of things no like my uh ryan and i's most favorite like drag names are the punniest ones mm -hmm. that that stand out so yeah uh i i think it'll be fine i just think maybe this is more of a mixture of like bond girls with drag queens which I feel right like fits, right absolutely okay so are you ready i'm ready i will give you a drag queen name you mm -hmm. tell me which of the movies that we have covered uh, inspired Got that it. name? And I can provide a hint. If okay. Needed, yeah, yeah, some yeah. of these might be weirdly hard. Sure. 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 Okay. Number one, Delica Tessa. Delica Tessa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's such a good one. Uh, that is obviously when Harry met Sally. Jonathan thought you weren't going to get that. He, he said that one's too hard. Well, he can get fucked because yeah. that. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Okay. Oh, great, great. He thought that was the hardest one? Amazing. Number two, Cerulean Montgomery. Cerulean Montgomery is a damn good <laughs> drag queen name. Oh, my God, Joe. You have a talent for this. Uh, that is from uh, The Devil Wears Prada. Nice. Our first episode. Yes. Number episode three. one. Go back and listen to it, y'all. Are you ready? Uh-huh. Carrie O.K. Carrie O.K. These are dynamite, Joe. <laughs> shit. Uh, that is uh, Lost in Translation. Nice. Yes. Carrie, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, Botanica Spectre. Botanica Spectre. Botanica Spectre. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Nice. Yeah. I went the plant route, and then I went the Ronnie Spectre route. <laughs> um, okay. Number five, mm -hmm. Gitchy Gitchy Ya Ya. <laughs> Uh, 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 that is Moulin Rouge, Joe. Fantastic. Incredible. Number six. Uh -huh. Miss Mayflower. Miss Mayflower. Miss Mayflower. Oh my God, I'm blanking. Episode number. What episode number is this? Um, This was kind of back in November of last year. I don't know the episode number, so it's probably like five or six. Miss Mayflower. I should we have did given a... you like the list of all the movies. We did a Pilgrim this. movie? It was our Thanksgiving episode last year in that it was like a spiritual Thanksgiving episode. Oh, that's Thanksgiving. right. It was the Mayflower thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, best in show. Yes. That's right. Oh, man. Okay. You got it. You got it. I said I would give you hints. Um, number seven, Miss Mayhem. Miss Mayhem. Well, okay. So it can't, it's not Labyrinth. It's got to be Muppet Treasure Lab. Treasure no. Island. 
No. Miss Mayhem? Mm hmm. Well, we did Muppet Mayhem, so is it Labyrinth? Oh, fuck. Yeah, I forgot we did Muppet Mayhem. No, it's not one of the Muppet movies. It's not? No. Okay. Miss Mayhem. It's one that's more like specifically about mayhem and things that cause it. Uh, was it your movie or my movie? It was your movie. Ooh. I think in like a Ooh. 80s sense. Okay. 80s mayhem. Oh my god, I, I can't even Water remember which one. plays a role here. Is it Waterworld? We didn't do Waterworld. We didn't do Waterworld. We didn't do but Waterworld. God, we should. But we've both seen it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should bring someone who hasn't seen it. Uh, it's a holiday-themed episode that we did. Oh, was it Gremlins? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number eight. Luna More. Luna More. Uh, that is Moonstruck. Hell yeah. Okay, number nine. Harvard Brown, PhD. <laughs> oh, Harvard Brown. Oh, this is the social network. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, number 10. You've, we'll say you have a perfect score so far. Hell yeah, I do. This is the one that'll be a hard one. <gasps> Benjamina Gunn. Benjamina Gunn, okay. <laughs> Uh, Muppet Treasure Island. Nice. Amazing. Miss Piggy, original drag character. Um, Big time, like, drag advocate, for sure. Justin, you were able to name 10 out of 10 of that drag. With a little bit, of, with minor help. Which I know? love to provide. You have such a talent for naming drag queen names. I was really worried going into this. Um, I realized, like, finding, like, a fierce drag queen persona name is hard as hell. It is. Uh... But let me let me see the list. What was my most favorite we'll, one? We'll post we'll post the full list on social. Oh, what was my favorite one? Uh, fucking Delicatessa. It's <laughs> fucking brilliant, dude. Yeah, we were really worried about that one. As well as Carrie OK. <laughs> Carrie OK. Oh my god. I mean, because cause like you said, you know, drag queens are more known for their lip syncing. So like, it's essentially karaoke, right? But you got to yeah. put on a good show too. Hilarious, Joe. Well done. Thank you so much. You get a 10 out of 10. I came up with those this morning. You know, I finished that video earlier this morning, so we do our best work against the wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was Tu Wong Fu. That was Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Dumas. Exclamation part point and maybe some hearts over some eyes and stuff like that like amazing movie joe As great always, pick. justin we are we are very happy when one of us gets like a cultural bucket filled um, yeah um and you got to check that box this time around yeah. um do you want to before we before we round this out do you want to talk a little bit about what our july might look like yeah and do you have the list here, and i you know? and i kind of wish we would have solidified what are we talk about in july i know we We'll we, say like these are our quasi plans. For July. These are quasi a, plans. We June's may, like a really long month. June is a long month. We have another week left. We could do something else. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I were spitballing with you know our social media manager, creative director role that she wears. Freaking you know, sucking us dry from a monetary standpoint. I know, right? Um, so maybe July we can do our bonus episode, fill in the gap kind yeah. of stuff. We could do that. We've been talking about like sampling other types of media besides mm -hmm. film, kind of uh, taking the cinematic off of the UCU. Um, uh, and so uh, we may like dip into television. We may dip into music uh, areas. Maybe of video games. Entertainment. Entertainment uh, at large. We Who knows? But what we have down here plotted out tentatively for july is what we have our our favorite movie theater going experience mm. and everyone has one of those i think it's it's either like the first time you ever got you you know you ever got dragged to a theater or you know it's your first like really memorable thing of like going to like a midnight premiere or something like yeah. that right um the one that i had down is a cult classic mm -hmm. But I remember being so excited when that movie came out. And my friend and I, once we left, we could not stop talking about it for the weeks after. <laughs> and our reactions throughout the whole movie were just insane. We were, this was probably about the same time in 1995. I was, you know, eight years old, mm -hmm. gonna go, going to go see this movie. 
uh, the movie in particular I'm talking about is Mortal Kombat with a K. Mortal Kombat that popularized video game. In the early 90s. That'd be a fun one to talk about. I, I watched the recent one that came out. Uh, oh, the one that hit like HBO Max or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was okay. Yeah, um, it's okay. This, I needed it to be a little campier. I don't know. Then that's what this one is. This one is bonkers over the top. It is ridiculous. Um, but it was one of my more favorite movie-going experiences that I can remember. Yeah. So we'll we'll solidify what the the July miniseries is. We've got some time here, but um, we're we're kind of in blockbuster season. Uh, that, so that's kind of the direction that we're headed. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about big movies. You know, we've done twenty episodes, and no you know, we've matured, matured a lot. Have we matured? I feel like just I've grown years. I'm ready to drive since Devil. Yeah, right. Um, I can remember the conversations we had. Um, but yeah, this was great. This was a wonderful Pride Month. Hopefully we can fill in the gap one more time mm-hmm. before the, the month ends out. A little mini sewed. Uh, a little mini sewed. We'll, we'll do that. But um, yeah, had a hell of a time. This was great. We did it in person, Joe. High five. We'll see if this works. I really hope uh, the audio actually ends up being uh, I'm sure it's when fine. we hang up on this. I'm sure it's fine. If not, we'll just re-record and we'll do it again. Yeah. From the top. Yeah. All right, everybody. This was great. Uh uh, Uncultured Cinematic Universe, you know where to check us out. Like, review, and res- uh, subscribe. Do all the things, and uh, we'll catch you later. Bye.